Metro Day, since Louisville basketball is not necessarily dramatic. The show that is Louisville basketball, it just never ends around here. Uh, and so here we are, recording a podcast at 11 Eastern, 10 Eastern, on a Saturday night, as uh, both of our significant others, I imagine, sleep. Right, Jake? Is that my correct? Girl, my girlfriend's drunk in the living room. Okay, drunk in the living room. My wife has passed out with the six-year-old who would not go to sleep tonight. But we're here because there's some very interesting news that I don't think anybody expected. I'm Jacob Lane. For those watching, Jay Cook, normal uh, host of Starting 502. I'm filling in for Press Meyer tonight because there is a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, as I mentioned, news that we did not expect to get this evening that now – um, since the coaching search for Josh Hurd in the Louisville basketball program in a completely different direction, we're going to dive into all of that, kind of recap the timeline, and then reevaluate, Jake, in real time here, what this coaching big board looks like, um, because really you're starting from scratch. So let me let me ask you this as we get going here. I'm trying to man, like I feel like, like I said, it's like a news desk. I'm trying to man like three screens. I've got random ass tabs if you want to know minnesota's tournament record from 2015 to 2022 <laughs> i have it here as i start to dig through these candidates but um big news of the night dusty may officially headed not to louisville dude Michigan. i lit i literally was just chilling hanging with my friend at a bar looked down at my phone i have adrian wodronowski notifications on twitter and he breaks NBA news like almost exclusively he might occasionally dabble in like NFL or some other sport and I look down and it says Florida Atlantic head coach Dusty May and I'm reading I'm like oh yeah here's the official here's the official statement he's coming to Louisville agrees to a coaching deal with University of Michigan and I'm like what 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 the fuck like just absolutely at a loss for words and I'm like is this and I was like is this a fake Woj account and I was like no I I got the notification it can't be it can't it's real and then the new Twitter is dangerous for that yeah, yeah, man. I always am like, that's a fake Woj. That's a mm-hmm. fake, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, I felt the same way. Look, checked. I'm like, oh, shit. This is really Dusty May spurring Louisville, I, I think, right? So let me just recap here, Jake. This is the timeline that I quickly pulled together, right? So leading up from the end of the season when Louisville goes down to NC State to the firing of Kenny Payne, all the way up through March 20th, it appeared that Louisville was all in. Their eggs were totally in the basket of – Uh, Scott Drew at Baylor with this number two candidate that they had, right? So we move forward. Obviously, we find out the reporting from Jody Dimling and Jeff Goodman, all the big college basketball reporters, that Scott Drew is going to stay in Waco, likely going to see an extension, some NIL improvements there uh, for Baylor. Um, And so it quickly turns to Dusty May, right? And then they fall to Northwestern in overtime yesterday. And it seemed like even though there were reports that he may be interested in Michigan, he may have interest in Vanderbilt, but it seemed like Louisville and Dusty May were on a collision course of kind of figuring things out, even to the point of today, this tweet from Drew Diener. This is, this is, this is great here. I don't know if you've seen this. You've been at a bar, so this is probably like all fresh to you. So you can react to this in real time. But he says on Twitter four hours ago, for the 10,000 people texting me, is it a done deal? Done deal is a stupid phrase, which is actually kind of really interesting that he says that. Nothing is final until it's final, but unless Dusty May suddenly decides to rob a bank, then he'll be the next. He'll be the head coach by midweek. So, Jesus. so it's. I mean, that's what everyone was saying. Right, Dusty May appears to have robbed a bank. Uh, uh, what happened is what I'm, I'm figuring out, reading between the lines here. But he goes off to Michigan, which. Like you said, I mean, to to get that, the juxtaposition to get that tweet from uh, Adrian Wojnarowski just three, four hours later that he's going to to Michigan shows you how quickly this changes. But it brings up a lot of questions about why, what, where were they in the process? Could it have been um, that he said, you know, he had the offer, was ready to sign it and said no. Michigan, you know, upped their offer by what a million, two million, three million dollars? Because as we've heard, the 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 Jordan bag run runs deep, right? Like somebody told me with confidence that Michigan would be able to afford the buyout of Mick Cronin, it wouldn't bat an eye at it, right? Like whereas here, Louisville's not paying and still is not paying sixteen million dollars for Mick Cronin. Like no chance they will go the mid major route. But uh, where that gets us there is that. Michigan has money to offer and is a little bit more attractive to the point that this is the the 
Adrian Wojnarowski version of what I, I saw somebody say that it probably was copied and pasted from Dusty May's agent. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. You tell me if you read if I read this to you and you didn't know who he was talking about, if you thought this was Louisville, he says May became swept away with the alumni network and its fierce loyalty to the university and athletics sources said his belief is that that will tra help transcend some of the inherently transactional nature of the modern NIL and transfer portal era in recruiting and player retention. I literally read that and I was like, is this not a description of Louisville? Like That's, this is everything we've been told. Exactly. To the point, like, a, a, like a, a lot of this just doesn't make sense to me. This is the most jargon statement that means nothing here. Like just trying to le read between the lines. I, I just feel like there's too much pressure at Louisville for him. Like there's just too much at stake. And at Michigan, maybe it's just a little bit more comfortable. I don't, I don't know. That doesn't, it's not as if like there's a, I get Louisville is like a blue blood program, but in the, the landscape of the last, what, 30 years outside of the 80, I mean, they're not too terribly different, right? I mean, Louisville, yes, has had a lot more success, but Michigan has been relevant for the most part. They obviously had the Fab Four, the Fab Five. They've, you know, went to the national title a couple of years ago. They played Louisville in the national title. You know, it's it, they've been pretty close, but for them to be able to come in and take a coach, I just I, – I can't draw any other conclusions, Jake, that the pressure is just too big. Like he just doesn't think he could come here and have the success maybe or whatever. I don't know. It's it's either that or it's – I kind of read it as maybe came swept away with the $7 million a year offer. Is like That's the only other thing because they've got Big Ten money. They've got the new ESPN deal that the Big Ten and SEC has. That's the only other thing I can think. But I had heard rumors about – him not being huge about being in the spotlight. And if you're a Louisville coach, if you're a Kentucky coach, if you're a Kansas coach, if you're an Indiana coach, you will be in the spotlight. You will be the biggest deal in that state, in that city, wherever it is. So it's got to be one of those two things. Yeah. I mean, I get the, the cultural fit needing to be more um, perfect than ever before here. Um, but I just, I, I it really seemed that Dusty May was going to be able to come in here and be your, you know, you you mentioned this and I we talked about this a couple of days ago, but be your next Denny Crum, like in terms of and Rick Pitino, in terms of being here for 20 years, you know, retiring mm -hmm. here or getting close to it. Um, and I I I really just outside of pressure, outside of, you know, maybe it's this new landscape where the Big Ten is going to be, you know, vastly superior to the ACC played into it. I mean this move would lend lend you to believe that the ACC is a low a low power six school now or a mm -hmm. conference now. You know what I mean in terms of being able to attract coaches. Look at the coaches top to bottom, and the ACC compared to the to the Big Ten. And I, and this is the same thing that happened with the the SEC a couple of years ago. You saw this boom in coaches rushing to the conference. You know the Bruce Pearls and the Eric Musselmans and you know all these guys going into the SEC and and it built up to where now they're getting what eight nine teams in the league. They've expanded. The Big Ten is now doing that, and it, it, maybe that's part of it. Is the conference realignment leads Michigan to be in a better spot overall than Louisville? I I just, I, I don't know. I I really don't know, man. I'm grasping at straws here, Jake. Like I'm I'm just torn. I. I'm hoping it's money. I'm thinking it's money. I'm I'm praying that it is money because if it's not, then that is kind of damning on the situation that we could be in and that really any AC school, ACC school could be in that doesn't bounce to the SEC or the Big Ten in the next five years. Because if that is the case, then if Louisville can't hire their number one choice or I guess our number two choice behind Scott Drew, then there's no chance Wake Forest can. There's no chance NC State can. There's no chance Georgia Tech can. There's no chance for any of these schools to be able to get the guys they want. So I'm I'm hoping it's that Jordan money. I'm hoping it's that new ESPN money that Miss Michigan was just able to throw at him that Louisville was just like, no, we're not willing to pay this un relatively unproven coach $7.5 million a year, $7 million a year, whatever his contract ends up being. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, and if that's the case, right, if it ends up being a bidding war and we see that contract be that, like, I'm fine with Josh Hurd walking away at that point. Like, because 
Dusty May, yes, he has a final four, and that is uh, that holds an incredible amount of value to me. Don't let anybody tell you that that final four, and you might have met, so maybe I, I I can't remember where you stood on this, but that final four, I get that it, they had to, some teams got beat along the way, but that's to win those games over that two or three weekend span is that's not easy to do for anybody, right? Oh, yeah. Um, to have that, but if you take that away, you look at this year's performance, you look at the tournament success this year, and then you look at the years prior to that. Dusty May's not that different than Pat Kelsey, than um, Bucky McMillan, who we'll you know we'll talk about from you know some of these other coaches now uh, that you're starting to hear come up in conversations. This list that has. This list that I concocted tonight, Jake, has at least three three or four new names on it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, just looking at it. So I, I can commend Josh Hurd for not giving Dusty May $7 million, right? Like, if you don't think he's worthy of that, walk away. Because that also, one of the things that's really important to consider is, like, the ceiling of which you're going to go upwards to. Like, if Dusty May comes in here in year one and say Indiana opens year year the first off season or the second off season, you're gonna have to give him a raise, right? And then what? You're talking about Dusty May potentially being at eight, eight and a half million. Like that's there's no chance that he's worth that this 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 early. So I think that if uh, that's the if that's the the scenario, Jake and money is uh, is at play here. I think that's a smart move if that's the case. If not, and it's similar money. And it's just a matter of, you know, comparing apples to oranges here or apples to apples and ultimately choosing Michigan. I think that's pretty damning of where Louisville basketball is at this point and how far they've fallen. And it confirms my fear that they might quickly be becoming the Tennessee football of a few years ago of all those bad coaches that they had and becoming irrelevant, that they're now becoming that on the basketball side. Yeah, I think whenever his contract details become public, I think think that'll be a really big thing if it's six six point five seven seven point five million then i can be like okay josh her decided that fiscally that was not a responsible decision because you're right outside of a final four run outside of last year really he is pat kelsey he is bucky brooks like he he is these mid-major coaches that have done a really good job they just haven't had that final four run like he had but if he comes out and michigan paid him four million four point five million then at that point I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, he just he just truly chose Michigan over Louisville. So I'm really hoping that that contract comes out and it's Dusty May, seven years, forty two million, seven years, forty five yeah. million, something like that. Where you're like, oh, six, six point five, seven. You're like, okay, I like get it. Stock in Jordan, like yes. you know, like some kind of asinine deal where you're like, okay, all right, that the bag's just different, you know, yeah, like, yeah. and you can't. Louisville is not financially in a place to go and drop that on a non elite head coach. Like they're just not, and you're, you're not going to see Josh Hurd tank the program if it means not getting a sure thing. And I think for the reasons we've, you guys have talked on this show for the reasons that some of the other podcasts have talked about from the other media outlets to fans on, on Twitter, it, it, it's a real mixed bag of whether you're super excited, kind of excited, or just flat out meh, uh, you know, on, on the dusty may train. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I think I, so I last podcast, we spoke about it. I think at that point, Scott drew had a reports had came out that Scott drew was not going to take the job. And he made a statement with a local Waco radio station that like, said he was going to stay at Baylor, but it kind of sounded like coach speak where it's like, oh, maybe he's leaving it out. And so we left it at like five or five or 10% chance that he comes to Louisville. He's expressed since then that that's not happening at all. And then, so I looked back at Dusty May and I appreciated his offense and I watched him a little bit more and I reconsidered the record and I was like, okay, it is impressive what he's done at FAU, but I think it is fair that Josh Hurd's like, you aren't Scott Drew, you aren't worth seven million, eight million, whatever. So if that's the that's what I'm hoping the case is. The other thing is Scott Drew. When I originally not Scott Drew, sorry, Dusty May. Whenever I originally made the coaching search list, he was like eleventh or twelfth on the list. So to me, there are still coaches available that are better than Dusty May, that have a better like history, have a better rapport in recruiting in the transfer portal. 
are better at really everything than what he was. So I think it's not like this is just a kill shot. We're like, oh, shit, now we've got to go hire Kentucky Wesleyan's head coach or something like that. Like, there are still great options out there. Yeah, no, it's definitely it's definitely not a kill shot, uh, but it is in a way damning again because you know how these things go, Jake. In terms of you gotta you you have your initial link, you know, group of of candidates that you're linked to, pretty quickly reports get out on who you're narrowing in on. If that coach doesn't agree, then you have to fall back, and you already have that. Well, you didn't get your first guy, and then if your second guy doesn't say yes, then you're like, okay, now we're down to our third and fourth guy, like the rest of that context doesn't always catch up to the actual decision. And so I think it looks bad for Louisville here because they were supposed to be able to go out and hire a Scott Drew because it's like, why would I not go to Louisville over a bake, a, a Baco, a Waco, Texas and stay in Baylor. But in this day and age, you can win a title at Baylor just as easily as you can win a title at Louisville. You can win a title at, you know, a lot of these schools, the recipe really is having a, you know, obviously a solid coach, but then the ability to to recruit via NIL and having the, the funds available and then all the other things that go into facilities and amenities and all those things. Right. And so for Scott Drew, he can do that where he's been for 20 years. He can be comfortable and win a title. And, you know, uh, for now, for Louisville, hmm. seems like, well, you can't get who you want. So you're not elite. And that honestly, Jake, that probably is the case at this point. Uh, but like you said, I think there's a lot of coaches out there uh, who bring excitement still, who maybe should have been considered before, maybe they were considered before, or, you know, uh, a set of, of names that are coming of mention because of tournament success in this current run of the NCAA tournament or, uh, you know, being linked to the job previously. So let's do this. I asked uh, Twitter uh, to give me their top three. This is via the state of Louisville account at the state of Lou on Twitter. Um, I asked um, to give the top three candidates now that Dusty May is out. I just wanted to, to evaluate the landscape. I think there's one answer almost unanimously that is on every one of these tweets, Jake. Like seriously, one one guy who's on every one say. of these. Yeah, I bet you do. But then outside of that, uh, it's a good mix of candidates that just aren't realistic. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I say that as in like, a uh, let's just say Brad Stevens or a Shaka Smart or a. Um, Someone said Jay Wright, Billy Donovan, Mark Few. Yeah, I saw that one. I'm like, yeah, that does. I would, lo yeah. <laughs> All I those would love would be that. Great. Not feasible, but I would love that. Uh, Billy Donovan, Jay Wright, Bruce Pearl. Um, let's see. I'm just scrolling down. Chris Chris Beard, Fred Hoiberg, Mark Few, Ben McCollum. Who is that? I feel like I should know who that is. Who is Ben McCollum? Do you know? I'm I'm unsure. I'm sorry. I've, Somebody... I've, I've done a lot of search searching on coaching candidates. I don't know who that is. Yeah, I don't I'm know sure. that. I feel like that's not a real person in the coaching game. I also feel like at the same time I could be just completely overlooking somebody, and I look like an idiot right now. Uh, um, ben McCollum is the Northwest Missouri State head coach. Ah, so we're talking. So we're talking a little JUCO. <laughs> we're talking a little JUCO coach in the in the rink here. Yeah, no, I'm gonna go ahead and axe that one three times. Uh, but then you scroll down and you start to see a couple of other names that uh, have been mentioned, and that's Jerome Tang or Eric Musselman. Um, Jamie Dixon has been mentioned. Richard Patino has been mentioned. Uh, so. I'm leaving out a couple of names on purpose, I guess, just to kind of build suspense here. But let's let's circle back to the comment I make I made about <clears throat> one coach being included in every tweet. I think Jake, you know who that is um, in our audience. Maybe they do, and maybe they don't. So let me ask you who that is to you. Most likely, I mean, I you can see these tweets, so you can obviously conclude yourself. I mean, but would you have guessed that that it is a, a Will Wade? Yeah, Will Wade. I see everywhere and. I think it's been made entirely clear by Josh Hurd that he's not a candidate. I mean, he hasn't come out and said, I'm not looking at Will Wade. But based on his comments, you can see that like he said he has a higher threshold for character than the yeah. normal person does when it comes to this search process. If that's anybody, it's the dude that still has a show cause out. Like, yeah. I don't, I understand why people want him. He is a good basketball coach, but I think it's so very clear that he's not going to be considered.
Yeah, I think that um, he would uh, he would be a, a really nice candidate in most circumstances, just based off of his ability to win at uh, the the multiple stops he's had. You know, being all the way up to LSU and now again this past season with McNeese. But whew, man, I picked them to go far in the tournament. You and I both had that in common. I think we we uh, found that common ground the other day. But I had them in the final, in one of my final fours, not the final four. Like I'm killing mm-hmm. my brackets in the 90th, 90th percentile still right now. <laughs> but um, I was shocked that they got their ass beat the way that they did. Um, but Will Wade, yeah, I mean Josh Hurd talked about that. But the other thing that I forgot and I read, um, just trying to go back and and just like get all the context and details of the show clause was that. Will Wade also had a situation in which uh, he was accused of having an affair uh, with another woman, and she essentially extorted him to some ex- to some extent, uh, and he paid her hush money, uh, and then it ultimately kind of blew up, and there was some, you know, some, I, I don't really know the full story, to be quite honest with you, but there's other things like that that are not basketball related that maybe Josh Hurd is also considering because like maybe now Jake, you get a little bit more desperate for a guy like Will Wade. If you think that he is the guy, but it doesn't appear that Josh Hurd thinks that he's even remotely close to the guy, right? Just based off what we know, but that's who all the fans want outside of that. There's not a consensus coach out there who fans mentioned. I mean, like I said, we ranged from Jay Wright to Buzz Williams to, uh, TJ Olsenberger to uh, Ben McCollum. Like, so we're all over the board here. Northwest Missouri State legend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, him. you know, jumping up a level. No one said you could, you can't do that, I guess. But at Scotty Davenport, I just want to block everybody that says that. My God, mm-hmm. what were they like four and 32 this season or something? Get out of and here. And he's also extremely old. Yeah. The other, the other question that uh, the other candidate that I've seen mentioned again is Chris Beard, but for the same reasons, I just, I don't see a scenario in which he's even included. Like you and I can both agree that he's a good candidate and under most circumstances, even maybe you feel even under what, what happened at Texas, that he should still be included, but he's not likely going to be included. So when you look at the power six candidates, Jake, here are kind of the names that stand out. Um, and there's one in particular that's new on this list. And we'll talk about where that name has been linked to a couple of times, but the number one candidate and, uh, your number one candidate, I'm pretty sure is still on the board here and seems to be looking at jumping to another position and another school. And that's Eric Musselman, uh, still on the board still has the same, I think like, isn't it? a fairly low buyout, like a million or less or something like that. $750,000 buyout, baby. I, Josh Hurd could pay that, pay that out of his own pocket. If he really we could do a to. GoFundMe state of Louisville yeah. could do a GoFundMe and probably make that Eric Musselman. I'd I've from the very beginning. I, when I made this coaching search list, I had Scott drew at the top. I had NATO at the top. Eric Musselman sat like fourth or fifth. And then we wrote, I wrote an article and I said, this is the guy I think we land on based on his combo of coach quality and hiring feasibility, he made the most sense to me. I mean, $750,000 buyout, I've said it a hundred times, you don't find that at high level D1 coaching spots. Like you're typically paying four or 5 million at least for a high level coach like this. And then add on the fact that he's had multiple top 10 recruiting classes in the two years of the transfer portal, he's been fifth and seventh. I mean, every single can every single transfer portal player, when they, list out their schools that have contacted him arkansas's on there they got a fucking it's, call it's, center dude i'm convinced that he has set up the eric musselman transfer portal call call center and they have 15 employees that they just monitor the portal and if they're any good they call them and they just just to call them it might even be an automated automatic like voicemail message that just like this is arkansas we're interested like they, they just call them they get their name out there if you average more than 10 points per game at the division one level, (laughs) you are getting a call from Eric Musselman. Yes. Like I just like, he makes the most sense to me. I don't understand. Like he had, when I made the coaching search, um, Google sheet before Arkansas struggled even more at the end of the season, he had the highest winning percentage of any coach on this list, 215, 86, a 0.714. So a 72% win percentage almost like that's insane. Like even like Scott drew, 65% 65% winning percentage. Kelvin Sampson, 69% winning percentage. Like a ridiculous winning percentage at Arkansas and Nevada, which are not high, like super high level basketball programs. No. A no. super low buyout, an ability to dominate the transfer portal, 
an ability to have a top 10 recruiting class still is only 59. So you'd get probably 10 to 15 years out of him. So to me, he is the candidate. I don't know if there's something that Josh Hurd doesn't like about him, but to me, I mean, he just makes the most sense. He's He's been my number one candidate for a long time. So I'm hoping that with Dusty May out of the picture, maybe he becomes that number one candidate. I don't know if that'll be the case, but I, that's what I'm hoping for. I've always uh, really admired what he did as a coach, even all the way back to the Nevada days when he took the team to, uh, what was it, the Elite Eight? final. I can't remember if it was a Final Four, but Elite Eight that had the Martin Twins, um, and they had um, uh, Larry Drew's son, and they had a couple of other really talented players that he recruited You know, from at that time before the portal existed and was able to turn that school around when he took that job. Um, he, you know, he has NBA experience as well. Um, I believe, you know, his coach in the, the development leagues, um, is very well traveled, knows the game of basketball very well. I, I honestly, I, I don't know much about, you know, his system. I don't know much about what he runs or how they play, but I do know that when he is winning, he has the same kind of like, it's not as lovable as a Bruce Pearl was or is, you know, in terms of like, just being like this kind of like jolly older man, but like he is the kind of energy that like our fan base wants in terms of like, you know, just being completely emotional, like being into every, like feeling, you know, your presence in every moment and being on the game, you know, you watch him and he's an active coacher on the sidelines. He yells a lot. Like there's little things about him that I think would do really well here. But I also think that he, it's almost like a pressure cooker. And I, I don't know how the kind of like stubborn slash like prickly side that he does appear to have, how that would go over if they don't do well. You know what I mean? This season seemed like, you know, I didn't watch every press conference, but it seemed like he had some spats and seemed like he kind of was a little bit more irritable and, We've seen how that goes with Chris Mack. Like, we don't need to go through that again. And to me, he kind of, personality-wise, Jake, just feels a little bit like Chris Mack. Like, when it's good, everyone would love that he goes to Roosters and that he drinks Bud Light. But when it's bad, everybody can't stand that he eats wings and that he's probably hanging there, you know, chugging Miller Light at the lake. You know what I mean? Like, that's how quickly things turn here. So I just wonder how an Eric Musselman would handle that type of pressure when he's been at a Arkansas and he, which obviously the pressure is starting to kind of heat up on him now currently there. Um, and then it's been at Nevada and what, I think like Arizona state or Colorado state or some of, you know, some other schools that aren't necessarily basketball schools. I don't know. He's been fired from the NBA. I'm pretty sure. So I, I just, I definitely think there's a lot of positives with Eric Musselman. And I think at this point, like you you he's got the power six experience you you hire him if you can because the contract you can go out and get a coach and you know one thing's true jake they're gonna fucking dominate that portal Dude, i mean he just i mean I, the personality i understand i think he's a little bit brighter and more bubbly than chris mack was i think chris mack was a little more surly than he was but when he was happy when he was high off wins or whatever like he was an excitable personality but i think he was a little more surly than what can you Muscleman imagine Chris Mack taking his shirt off after a game? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can't. I just can't imagine that. That, but that's Muscleman though. Like me and Muscleman will be forty beers deep with our shirts off at you know at the at mid court. You know what I'm saying? Like he's that type of dude. It seems like. Yeah, I mean, I think if he wins here, I mean, I think he's he has the personality to thrive at Louisville. And here's my thing. I think I've told you this, but like I've I've said to people who ask me at work or just, you know, my my parents, my you know, my family, whatever, what what do I what do I think? And I've always said that like what Jeff Brom did, like you think it was pretty cool how the city like anointed him and like celebrated him and like rallied around him. Like if basketball does what Jeff Brom like if a basketball coach does what Jeff Brom did this year, they won't be like a king, Jake. They will be a God, like they will, they will be able to stop crime. They will be able to like increase birth rates. They will be able to like be the Taylor Swift of this city. I, I know that sounds kind of silly to say, but like when basketball is good here and you're getting 22, five down there on a Wednesday night, it's a different place. It's just a different city. You know, it's a completely different place. And I think that he, I think I could see him thriving in that, you know, this wouldn't be too big for him. Uh, I think 
as long as he's winning. When it's, you know, if he's not winning, that's a different challenge, which I guess that's a challenge for everyone. Uh, we've talked a bit about him. Let's let's kind of move it on here just um, for the sake of time. I know we want to kind of keep this at a, a reasonable amount of time, despite the fact that I know global basketball fans are consuming more content than they ever have right now, which is probably, Jake, let me reset the show here. Starting 502 podcast, Jacob Lane filling in for, for Pressmeyer, Jake Hook. We are talking global basketball. Dusty May says no. Interesting. Didn't expect this to happen. Show is brought to you by Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon. Be sure to check them out. The Bourbon of Russ Smith, uh, now sold online. Get it delivered to you uh, wherever you – Bowling Green, isn't that where you are, Jake? Yes, sir. Yeah, get get it delivered to Bowling Green. Get it delivered to Vermont. Get it delivered to most states. So check out the website there. Be sure to follow them on social media. Um, they've announced a lot of cool partnerships, including the TBT bottle. So uh, we're going to be doing maybe, some maybe, exciting Maybe we stuff. send one to Fayetteville, Arkansas, just while we're yeah. at it. Just send one yeah. out there. Yeah, there you go. I think we can do that. Um, I, he seems like the kind of guy who would drink Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon. Like he, he seems I like he would be. Think so. I, I, be, he seems like he'd be a cool dude. Like just in terms of like being around him. I, I need to do my a little bit more research in ter- just like personality wise. But let's talk about some of the other candidates um, who have been mentioned. Obviously, Mick Cronin is another one that that name is coming up here in these tweets quite a bit, Jake. But for obvious reasons that we've talked about, you're not for a coach who is not elite. You're not going to go pay a $16 million buyout unless you have a bag that is endless. And Louisville doesn't have a bag that's endless. Louisville, um, Louisville's got to go to the bank and get get borrowed funds to put in the bag. And it's, so that doesn't make it endless when it's when that's the case. So you can't go out and hire coaches and just pay thirty three million dollar buyouts and sixteen million dollar buyouts. You gotta you gotta be smart with that. So he's probably out. And then the name that Eric Crawford has mentioned um, on a couple of different occasions via Twitter, as well as in articles on uh, WDRB.com, he he calls out Shaheen Holloway. In fact, in an article published just like less than an hour ago, Jake, he is quoted towards the end of the article after Dusty May, you know, kind of recaps the news there and it says now attention tur- turns to another young candidate Seton Hall Shaheen Holloway who took the job at his alma mater two seasons ago after upsetting Kentucky and leading St. Peter's to a surprise trip to the elite eight sources say Louisville also has been impressed with college of Charleston coach Pat Kelsey let's start with Shaheen Holloway that's a name that you guys have not talked about on the show um, but Eric Crawford mentioned him a couple of days ago as a potential kind of candidate after Dusty May what do you think about Shaheen Holloway? I was a big fan of his energy and like just everything about him when they, when I say they, when he was at St. Peter's, which is where he was prior to Seton Hall, took that team to the Elite Eight. They obviously did what they did against Kentucky. They beat Purdue. Um, so, you know, it's pretty interesting to see that com- compared to like the FAU where they beat Farley Dickinson and then they, you know, get some of these other teams. But what is your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on Shaheen Holloway? I, I, I don't I don't really like it that much. I, I would talk myself into anything at this point because I know it would be an improvement over what we've had. But I mean, you look at the record at St. Peter's, it's it's barely over five hundred. He makes the tournament one time and he does have the magical run. And it is St. Peter's, and I get that. But he had two winning records at St. Peter's. And then he makes the Elite Eight. Then he goes to his alma mater, Seton Hall, which I think is a big deal. He played at Seton Hall for four years. He probably wants to stay there, if I had to guess. Like, maybe Louisville is enticing enough to make him leave, but, like, to me, like, to what Jeff Brom is to us, that's what Shaheen Holloway most likely is to Seton Hall. So, would be also very difficult to pull him away. In his two years at Seton Hall, 17 and 16 first year, lost in the NIT first round. This year, they improved, 21 and 12, but they still missed the NCAA tournament. So, to me, this guy does not have the head coaching record really at all to entice me that much. I know he's young and I know he's unproven and he took St. Peter's to an elite eight, but to me, I don't really see it. I still think there are a lot of, a lot of better candidates out there. Like I'd rather have Musselman. I'd rather have Dixon. I'd rather have Mick Cronin. I'd rather have Amir Abdurrahim. I'd rather have Jerome Tang, any of those guys over Shaheen Holloway. I don't think he's an awful coach by any means, but to me, I, I don't really understand that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, he obviously built uh, St. Peter's to be able to do something pretty, pretty special. And, you know, having my having my brother-in-law been in the the MAC conference, I've watched them pretty closely over the last couple of years. 
um, and, you know, pretty familiar with what those teams do and their capabilities. And for anybody out of that conference to go on a deep run, that's not a Rick Pitino coach team is really uh, in itself kind of showing just because of the resources, the recruiting, like they literally only recruit the Northeast for the most part. And there's a lot of talent up there, but everything is so regionalized. The funds are completely like just a, it's a completely different story with that. And St. Peter's was one of the, it, it's almost like the FAU of the Northeast. It, it was considered, I think Jeff Goodman said years ago, the worst job in college basketball. Um, so that shows you his ability to build and then to go to Seton hall um, and, and want to leave. I think my question is more about the motive of like, why would he want to leave his alma mater after two seasons? They they've been right there on the cusp of the first two years um, going to the NCAA tournament. They probably should have been in this year, uh, but went to the NIT this year, went to the NIT last year. And, I think all of that still is like fine because Seton Hall, you know, while they weren't in a bad place, he, you know, he's definitely competing in a conference that's much more competitive than what Kevin Willard was for the couple of years that he really had Seton Hall booming, at least in my opinion. I mean, the, the Big East now with UConn there is, you know, extremely, extremely potent. Uh, and then you have Rick Patino, you know, and the list goes on and on. Um, but I, I just... I think that he's an okay coach. I think that that run is not a fluke run to beat those teams that he did. I think shows you that he can coach. Uh, I think that for him to want to leave his alma mater, I I think the thing would be, would probably be around NIL uh, because I just don't think at Seton Hall that they're getting what they need just from what I've seen this year online and some of the comments and all of that. But the other thing is that he did have some comments as a coach on NIL last year that just are very similar to what Kenny Payne kind of said about like players asking about NIL and he's not interested in starting the conversation there. I, I just, for all those reasons for me, I think he's a good coach. I would, if he got hired here, like you said, I could talk myself into it. I think that he wouldn't be a bad coach. I think it would be really exciting energy that he would bring, but I'm not convinced that they would be any more, uh, apt to turn it around and become a title contender. I just, I just don't think that would be the case. Yeah. I'm like you said, I would be able to talk myself into it, but that'd be like a D tier nearly like D minus tier higher. If that's who we ended up with, I think it would be very difficult for me to look back at all the candidates that we had and be like, we landed on Shaheen Holloway. Hell yeah. Way to go. Josh heard like, that's not, that's not how I would feel at all. And that's not how I think, any of the fan base would feel either. Yeah. Again, for the people watching, I'm I'm trying to manage all of this at one time and look this up. I mean, he's 47, so he's the same age as Dusty May. Mm -hmm. um, and I, when you talk about just the overall mentality and the overall kind of like culture building, and you go back and you watch the way that the players responded to him and the way that they played it for St. Peter's a couple of years ago. And even now, just with Seton Hall this past season, the some of the wins that they had, you you can tell that his style of coaching, his his personality, like he he is a a one just an absolute gem of a coach when it comes to connecting with the players and like development and all of that. Um, but he's never been in an environment where basketball is king. Like you know, he, he played at Seton Hall, you know, obviously coached at St. Peter's was an assistant at Seton Hall and Iona previously, like those are just not Louisville. And I just don't, and not, nobody is going to be stepping into a job where they've had this level of pressure and experience. I just, it just doesn't get me. It doesn't get me excited. I, you know, there's other names I that agree. I would look at. So the other name is Pat Kelsey. We're kind of jumping to the mid majors here. Um, I can't, I like, I literally can't even entertain the conversation. It, it, when people say it, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I, I am so tired of people mentioning Pat Kelsey for this job. And I get that Charleston won like 34 games last year. I get that he's taken them to the tournament the last three years. He did the same thing at what was it? Winthrop or VMI? Yeah. I think it was Winthrop. Winthrop. He was, yeah, he's got a, a, he comes from a strong coaching tree, but no, it, it no. Chris Mack is the coaching tree and some of the others that Louisville is Dino Gaudio and other, I just no, not even, I'm not entertaining it. No, I, again, same level as a Shaheen Holloway hire to me. I mean, 
inexperienced. He doesn't have the Elite Eight run, the Final Four run that Shaheen Holloway He had. doesn't have a tournament win. That's Yeah, he does. Yeah, he's made the tournament four times. Yeah, he's 0-4. So, he's 4. they got I, I blown think, out by Alabama. That was enough for me to be like, nope. I think the reason that people get excited by Pat Kelsey is because of the style that he plays, which is very, very frenetic, shoot threes, pace, 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 transition. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand why you could get infatuated with that kind of style and why you'd want a coach like that. But again, just unproven at this level or anywhere near this level, not even like doing it at like a Missouri or like an Oklahoma state, like doing it at Winthrop and Charleston and not even winning a single tournament game. So to me, that's another coach that it would take so much for me to be talked into another, another D D minus higher when there are still better candidates out there that I think would crawl to this job. Yeah. I thought that he would have been like a solid candidate for like a West Virginia. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oklahoma and they State, West hired... Virginia, one of those openings that makes more sense. Yes. I I'm totally with you. Um, so yeah, Pat Kelsey, no, not for me. Jumping back to the power levels, uh, the power six, uh, Amir Abdul Rahim is a name that I go back to. I think we, Louisville needs to have that conversation immediately. Um, you know, I think Jerome Tang is another one at Kansas State. I think Presley talked a little bit about, had heard some things around him, you know, interviewing at Louisville or being involved early and then not really making that cut. Uh, so I don't know if that's a conversation worth considering again. Had a lot of big wins. The season, they didn't make the tournament, um, but they also only had, I think, like seven scholarship, eight scholarship players. They were really depleted. Um, and... You know, I, the run of his, again, you know, you can make the case that it's him doing it with players that weren't his, like a, a Marquise Noel and a, a Naquan Tomlin. But still, you, you know, to my point kind of stands that to win that many games in that many days and over the course of three weeks is is very impressive, no matter who you are. And just the way that team rallied around him, just the way that, uh, you know, he kind of like stepped into the limelight. I think that that would do well here. Uh, as long as as long as he's winning, I think fans would get tired of him really quickly. If not, yeah, I agree. I think I mean it was impressive what he did in his first year. Kansas State was fourteen and seventeen the year before him. Took him to twenty six and ten with some of his new players, but with a lot of old returning players, and had an amazing elite eight run. And I think this year was the year prove it. If he goes twenty four and twelve or something like that and gets him to the Sweet 16, or even the round of 32, like continues to show that he has Kansas State on an upward trajectory, I think that he would be a very hireable candidate. But to me, two years of coaching experience at this point, all the rest yeah. of that time being an assistant with Scott Drew, I don't, I don't think that makes a lot of sense either. And in his two years with Kansas State, 23rd recruiting class, 73rd recruiting class, 35th yeah. in the transfer portal, 43rd in the transfer portal. $5 million buyout. So like, to me, it just, that doesn't line up as the right guy. Yeah. I'm kind of right there with you. I still think that some of the wins he had are attractive. And, um, you know, I think again, with some of the resources that you, you offer as a Louisville that, you know, you could make the argument that he would be able to kind of walk in and just be able to elevate everything and that it would just be the same kind of culture building and all of that, that would, um, you know, change from a location standpoint. So, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on him. I think, again, there's other names here. Um, Jamie Dixon, Steve Forbes, uh, like they are fine coaches, but, you know, TCU just got blown out uh, by Utah State, and they, for the last three or four years, have started strong and, and really tank late in the season, and you like to hire a coach where that's the opposite. Yeah, you obviously know this better than I do. Um, they've done a great job in the portal, though, man, like getting guys like Micah Peavy and – to have a Charles O'Bannon coming off of your bench and, uh, you know, Emmanuel Miller and Jameer Nelson and Trey Tennyson, like they did a great job of recruiting the portal. So, uh, you know, Jamie Dixon has done it for a long time. I don't know why he would want to leave his alma mater, right, TCU. Uh, so I, I, I'm i not sure if he's a fit there, but I, I, it wouldn't be the worst thing. He's a good basketball coach. Like at the end of the day, we can't forget that we need a good basketball coach. You know, there's a lot of other things that we talk about, but he's not the worst. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're, if you're in the Pat Kelsey, Shaheen Holloway, if that's where your mind's at, Jamie Dixon is a better hire than that. I, he's not my favorite hire, but I mean, he's a better hire than that. He's a proven 
winning head coach. What he did at Pittsburgh, like extremely impressive. His, his biggest issue was that he just didn't ever take them far enough in the tournament. But they yeah. were consistently like top five, top four, even winning the Big East back when the Big East was the Big East. Like they were so good there. And then he turned TCU from a team that I think made the tournament three times ever before him. They've now gone back to back to back years. He's gone four times and it's, yeah. he's literally – over a hundred percent of what they had before he was there. So, I mean, what he's doing at TCU, they've lost in the round of 64, the round of 32 every year, but like, that's really, really impressive to do at TCU. Like there's no basketball history there whatsoever. So, I mean, to me, you can do a lot, lot worse than Jamie Dixon. And he is starting to turn towards the transfer portal and starting to turn he, towards the recruiting. Not only he's, that, but he's killing it. He's killing it. Like, I mean, he was third in transfer portal this year. Yeah, 15th in the he's got the 15th best recruiting class like he's starting because before that it was 53rd recruiting class 94th 98th 58th he wasn't in it but now he's in it like he's starting to do it and that's what we need at Louisville is a coach that is going to be able to flip a roster with recruits and transfers in year one he's also if I'm not mistaken added like a pretty damn good staff like uh, if I'm not mistaken they've like added one or two assistants from big name schools over the last couple of years or something maybe I'm mistaken them with somebody else in the big 12 but They've recruited. No, they they added a UCLA's coach. That's what it is. Uh, the guy who was like responsible for, um, you know, a lot of the recruiting out uh, out west at UCLA with um, uh, 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 not Steve Lavin, but what God, what's the guy's name that was the head coach there before Steve Alford. Um, okay. And yeah, and so TCU has done a great job of getting modernized and getting into the transfer portal. Um, and so you know he's a coach I'm not afraid of. Last name here, uh, actually two more. Just real quick, Kevin Keats, I, they, they won again tonight against Oakland. They're going to the Sweet 16. They've won seven in a row. Prior to that, don't forget, this man was going to get probably axed. So don't I, – I mean, I know I've talked about winning a lot in the NCAA tournament, but I'm I'm not here for it right now. Don't do not do that to yourself. No, Kevin we, Keats, you put it beside it. Yuck. Yuck is we, the right word. We would be – we, in this case, would be their Cincinnati. Like yep. – we would be coming in, paying the buyout, and they're like, thank God he's <laughs> gone. Uh, and the last one here, here's the scenario I'm going to ask you on Bruce Pearl, okay? Would you take three years of Bruce Pearl with the guarantee that Stephen Pearl was going to be your head coach in waiting if you could get him at a $7 million clip for the three years and have him come here uh, like right away, like I, I mean, obviously right away, but come here, come here and be the head coach. But his head, his son was gonna have to be guaranteed to be the head coach in waiting. Do you take that deal? No, I do not. I, I mean, if you look at what I mean, Bruce Pearl is a great coach. If you told me I could just have Bruce Pearl straight up for, I'd say five, five to eight years, he's gonna be sixty five next year. Yeah, I would say yes. But I mean, Bruce Pearl has done well at Auburn, but they've never made it out of the round of thirty two. Which I mean, at the end of the day, that's what no, you're coaching. No, no, resume no, no, no. They went to the on. final four. No, that's not true. Oh, sorry, I missed one year. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I went, went to the final, final four. four. One year. The only reason I know that is because we've got a family friend that's on Bruce Pearl's staff, and we get uh, we we're all decked out. We got a shit ton of Auburn gear. My son wears the Auburn shirt to, to bed at least like once a week. So yeah, I remember the final four very very well uh, from my Auburn, bad, and bad. they should have beaten. They should have beat Virginia if you remember. Yeah the double dribble or travel, whatever it was. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I was like, that doesn't seem right. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. There was All the good. before that one year. Outside of that, though, it's been round of 32, round of 64 exits every single year. Got and like Auburn Yale. has been a, a – yeah, lost to Yale yesterday. They've been a solid team. But, yeah, I mean, you give me Bruce Pearl for five, eight years, yes. You give me Stephen Pearl, the 34-year-old Nepo baby. <laughs> I don't really need that. I'm okay. Yeah. If you just want to give me Bruce Pearl straight up. Yes, but I think he used Louisville two years ago to get a contract extension. He's 64 years old. I don't think he wants to leave. Maybe he does, but I that that to me just seems as unlikely as a hire as a Chris Beard or as he, a Will Wade. He's always kind of had this like savior complex and like – with the SEC the way it is, he could in theory like it take this kind of mindset of like I could go to Louisville, I'd be in a, a worse off conference, could be a top four. Like who look who the top four seeds is. Pittsburgh was a top four seed in the ACC this year. You could go and easily dominate that and like be the darling of the ACC and no longer have to worry about fucking pissing with you know John Cal Perry, maybe not for much longer. You know, the Eric Musselmans and Nate Oates and the Lamont Paris's and all these damn coaches that just seem to be coming out of nowhere to dominate in the SEC. 
All right, uh, mid majors, and then we'll get out of here. Um, Mark Byington is an interesting name at James Madison. I don't know much about him, but what I do know is that James Madison was freaking good this year. Um, and their performance and win over Wisconsin was not a, a shock to to your boy here because I picked them in my bracket. I actually have them in the Elite Eight. I think they're going to beat Duke tomorrow. Uh, if you're seeing this podcast, maybe that's today. So I think James Madison is a nice coach. He, if I'm not mistaken, was he like in his 40s? He looks young. Um, I think he could be an interesting candidate. Now, obviously, you're talking about not a proven track record at all. Um, and then you have Bucky McMillan, who is the head coach at Sanford. I think you said Bucky Brooks earlier, who yeah, is the Bucky NFL... Ball is what I was thinking. Bucky Ball. <laughs> yeah, Bucky Brooks is like an NFL draft commentator for the <laughs> NFL Network. That would be quite the hire. Louisville from left field here. Couldn't be worse Hiring... than Spain. Right. <laughs> right. In an upgrade. But uh, Bucky McMillan has a lot of people's attentions because of Sanford's performance this year. And they were honestly um, a Cinderella team projected to beat Kansas by a lot of folks, but went down in kind of dramatic fashion. Should have beat Kansas. That that call was awful. The only reason I'll stand by this, the only reason they call that is because uh, Nick Timberlake cannot muster up an ounce of athleticism in his body. I watched them again today. He is awful. I don't know how yep. that man got paid the way he did coming out of Towson. Dude, he sucked. He looked like playing at Southeast Christian up here uh, off Blankenbaker. Like, it's because it was Lord. the first time he ever tried to dunk, and he was like, "Oh shit, fuck!" Yeah, and he was on the way to go too like, late. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to land. What, like, what is this? What I'm so used hands? to with a layup, you can just you know left foot on the ground and just kind of like you know like the dunking bird. You don't have to get off the ground to do a layup. But no, I thought Sanford. Uh, I really like his, you know, the the offense they run. Again, I don't know much about him. I know that he has a very unconventional staff. He's got a couple of guys who um, were head coaches, one of which was at the D3 level at Barry College. Uh, and the only reason I know that, uh, pulling from my bag of knowledge here, is because my brother-in-law was on the staff that replaced that coaching staff that went from Barry College to Samford to follow Bucky McMillan. Um, and so uh, it's just really interesting kind of how his basketball has translated to Sanford. He's a guy, like when I look through the openings of college basketball right now, like he's somebody that a, uh, like rice or a SMU or, you know, somebody like in that level should be considering, in my opinion, Louisville should not be stooping down that far into the mid major ranks to hire a coach. I get he's, he's a hot name right now. But no chance on in my list are you hiring the you know fifth hottest mid major coach? Yeah, I mean, literally four years ago he was coaching at a high school. Yeah, he exactly. was hired from high school to Sanford, which he has done a great job at Sanford. Yes, he has done an incredible Fantastic. job, and he has a really exciting system. But that is not who Louisville hires. You do no. not hire, like you said, the fifth or sixth best mid major hire available. That's not what you do. Rice does. UTEP does. Yep. FAU might something like yeah. that. That makes sense. But at Louisville, not a chance. You can't take a coach that's gone to one NCAA tournament ever in his lifetime to be the head coach at Louisville no. in five years, maybe, but not right now. Not at exactly. all. Exactly. Exactly. And so I can't even say his name right. So yeah, Bucky no, Brooks, not right. right? Bucky Ball, Bucky Brooks. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, again, the the Richard Patino comments have come up, but I, I can't even in, come close to entertaining that one. I don't think that would ever happen or f- a slide in his family. I'll I'll be it though. I think his dad would tell him that that's a damn good job. Uh, but one tournament win and it's against Louisville. And he's made only what two or three appearance three appearances over the course of his career. His teams always do one thing. I will tell you this now. Go back and look over the last four or five years. His teams start out 6-0, 7-0, 12-0, 14-0, and then finish 21 and or you know, 24 and 11, 20, 22 and 14. Like they tank late in the year. He is He's not the exact a- opposite of Rick Patino. That's exactly right. Uh, and then a couple of other names. I just throw, Can I just throw one name off the wall at you and just get your thoughts? This might be the most out-of-left-field name, okay? Mm-hmm. I know we don't want to follow in the assistant route again because we kind of saw what happens when you give somebody a head coaching job for the first time. Can I interrupt you? I know who you're going to say. Okay. But for the Brad sake Calipari. of our – Yes. Brad yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. How did, I saw the way that he was dressed – in the tournament and i said he's the guy like he's built to be louisville's head coach he could connect this city in a way that we've never been connected we're the only ones brave enough to say it 
Uh, that's right. That's it. That's our we stake our claim on hire Brad Calipari. You get you get Brad, you get the family. Um, okay, so here here's the name. All right, and it, it's going to sound familiar. And and I don't know what the shock value might be when I say this, but it is a, a assistant from a very high level school. He's been at three high level schools. Has been a part of a team that was ranked number one, a team that's won a national championship, a team that's likely going to potentially compete for a national championship again this year is the favorite. He's been a part of elite eight runs, uh, sweet 16 runs. So Luke Murray at UConn, what are your thoughts potentially uh, an assistant like him who is young recruits, if armed with the portal with recruiting dollars, you don't have to pay a massive buyout you could potentially in theory get a guy before like the price goes way up. I don't know, man. I just still hold Louisville at such a higher standard than hiring, even, even a really good assistant at UConn, which I understand. And I think Luke Murray was wrongfully fired at Louisville. Yes. Should three, have never been ago. fired. Yeah. The higher ups told Chris Mack that he needed to make moves. He needed to make changes on his staff. And Luke Murray was just an unfortunate result of that. So he should have never been fired, but I hiring assistants. We have gone down this path before Louisville is such a bear of a position to hold. You have to have a high level experience at a program that has expectations like an Arkansas or like a Marquette. Like you have to be in that position to be able to understand what it takes and what you have to do. And to me, I think Luke Murray is probably a good coach, but I just don't think Louisville can go and, take that big of a risk but in you know five ten years when he's been a head coach at southeastern arkansas for a little bit and then he goes to like university of virginia arlington or something like that maybe but n not right now yeah he's certainly no ben mccollum though right i he's mean no ben McCollum, yeah. <laughs> he's no i've ben always McCollum. said that yeah that's what we've that's like a, a weekly uh running joke here on the show um let me run through this last thing and then we'll get out of here questions from twitter uh, somebody asked, um, what the fuck are we doing? That's a great question. Um, and I think <laughs> I if, don't I, know. if I had to summarize that, I would say number one call is to Eric Musselman tomorrow. Th my opinion, maybe, maybe not what everybody thinks here on the show, but my number one call is to Eric Musselman. I am making sure that my number is blocked for both Pat Kelsey and his agent. They're not sneaking into this conversation. We will entertain the idea of a Shaheen, a Shaheen Holloway, but I would prefer that you go and you address all the other candidates that we mentioned here. And even if you're going to include coaches at the power six level, I would not be opposed to a Sean Miller. Like, I, I mean, again, you have the NCAA violations not likely going to happen, but we're running out of options here. Damn it. So I'm open to those. Um, and then the other one is from uh, at Vince underscore per. It says, why should we have any faith in Josh Hurd moving forward? Um, that's a good question. And I think that fans obviously are starting to have a lot of qualms, um, as to what's going on and why he was kept for why Kenny Payne was kept and why, you know, he wasn't fired during the season to get a jump start on some of these things. And I think all those questions are valid, but I still think there's time to let the cake bake. And that I think for reasons we mentioned, Jake, that there's still time for the story to be told that Josh maybe did the right thing and his, almost like a fiduciary duty type of agent type of role for the university, like CEO best interest cannot bring in somebody that's going to, that's going to make you house poor. You know what I mean? You might hear that. You might, you're buying a house. You might, you might've heard yeah. that phrase before. I'm on the borderline. I'm on the borderline of being house poor here soon. Right. You don't want to be house poor by hiring somebody uh, at a, at a rate that doesn't make sense. And so maybe that's why it is that he walks away, but do you have faith in Josh Hurd? I still have faith in Josh Hurd, yes. But I think this hire is where my decision will change. Whether that's full faith, 100%, yes, Josh Hurd is the guy. He is the next Tom Jurich. Or, damn, why is he in this position? Why did he hire Kenny Payne? Why did he hold on to him for a year? He got lucky with Jeff Brom, all these kinds of things. So I think, I mean, this decision that he makes, this hire that he gets will truly define do we have any faith in Josh Hurd? Should we have faith in Josh Hurd? Yeah. And so what he does in the next 48 hours, I think is, is huge. It's astronomical. If he goes and quickly hires and gets Eric Musselman and boom, we're, 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 we're Arkansas. We're in every trans transfer portal players list. And we bring in eight new guys and keep Sky Clark and Brandon Huntley Hatfield and 
Trey White or Tyler Johnson, whoever you want it to be, then boom, yes, I have more faith. And that ends up being a success, yes. But I think this, it's a legitimate question to raise at this point. I really think it is. And I think this hire will be the answer to that question. Yeah. Gun to your head, who's the head coach? What do you say? Gun to your head, who does he hire? Eric Musman. Eric Musselman. Mainly because I, I want that to be the answer. Yeah, I think he's going to hire Shaheen Holloway. I just, that name's come up too many times. So maybe it's a smoke screen. I don't know, but it just feels that way at this point. Let's get out of here. We've kept you for enough time. Hopefully you found some insight in this conversation. We'll, we can die. You guys, I shouldn't say we, you guys can dive in a little bit deeper, uh, but this stuff is going to change pretty quickly. I would imagine by the time this episode airs, there's probably new names that have come out or names that have been extended, whatever the case is. Uh, We'll see. It's going to be a, tumult a tumultuous couple of days here, depending on who the hire is. But let's get out of here. Starting 502 Podcast, State of Louisville Podcast Network, powered by Kern's Corner. The show is brought to you by the fine folks at Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, Jacob Lane, Jake Hook, at the State of Lou, stateoflouisville.com. Well, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. We'll figure it out, Jake. We'll see you next time. Must, must, must. <laughs>